Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, a wheelie boat on Farmall Reservoir, Oxford, with me at the front and Andy in the back, trying to catch a fish. <sighs> Thank you, Bernard. And as well as fish this week, we have deer. We have the white red deer of Dartmoor and why they're so valuable to go and stalk. We have Roy Lupton after brown spotty deer, the fallow buck, and he has a tricky decision to make about whether to shoot it in the head or not. And we have stuff you never even knew you needed to know, how to cook a moose. First, it's back to Bernard, who's pushing the boat out in a good cause. Messing about in boats is a simple pleasure, but for some it's impractical. It's hard enough making an elegant entrance or exit to or from a craft with two legs in working order. If you're in a wheelchair, you might as well forget it. However, the Wheelie Boat Trust, inspired by fishermen and women, has been putting disabled people back onto the water. Actor and field sports enthusiast Bernard Cribbins has been involved with the Trust since its creation in 1985. He's come to one of his favourite fishing lakes near Oxford to help launch the newest wheelie boat in front of local media. Um, it's the most impressive wheelie boat to date, I think. I've seen all of them throughout their 20 odd years and uh, this is really impressive. I can't wait to get out there and have a go on it. Andy, who is in the wheelchair, is going to drive it. I'm going to be up on the anchor and the anchor man and uh, my kit's already in there all I've got to do is get that booby out there and get it wet uh, no I'm looking forward to it no I think it's a great invention the whole concept of the wheelie boat from the year dot which was 1985 when it was launched um, was a great thought to get our disabled friends able to go on the water you know and not just for fishing but for bird watching and you know just want to go out for a ride get kids out there have a splash about absolutely wonderful no, super idea. How long have you been involved with the, the wheelie boat? Um, since it kicked off, actually, in '85, Prince Charles launched it at the uh, Fishmongers Hall, and I was then involved with a charity called Sparks, which I'm still involved with, sport aiding medical research for kids, and they put up some money for some of the funding to get the original going. So on and off, we've been involved ever since. I launched one at Letchlade, not Letchlade, yes, Letchlade up the road. We did one about six, seven years ago. Chris Tarrant and I put one on Lynch Hill Fishery a while ago, a long time ago now, with Captain Terry Thomas, who's left us. See you, Terry. Um, and, uh, you know, there are lots of them all over the place. This, I think, is number 147. Um, and we could do with another 200 around the country because they are wonderful things for our friends who are in wheelchairs. One of the advantages of a boat like this is that fishermen who are in a wheelchair can compete in angling competitions in a standard craft alongside other able-bodied competitors. We're one of the largest boat builders in the UK and they wanted uh, wheelchair users to be able to use um, an existing designed boat so everybody can, can compete on, a, uh, on an even uh, uh, playing field. What are you particularly proud of about this particular vessel? Um, it's, uh, for, for us as a company, it's very expensive to build and financially it's not really worthwhile, but I do like to see everybody being able to use the uh, cool and range of boats. Andy Beadsley has helped create this newest wheelie boat. He has seen the initiative, born more than 25 years ago, take shape and develop into the craft we have today. Fishing very much remains at, at the heart of what we do and this is how this boat has come about. Rather than simply supplying a one-size-fits-all solution to fisheries and other waters, we designed a purpose-built fishing boat alongside Jim Coolan, the boat builder. He supplies these boats all over the UK and we've modified one of his models uh, into a wheelchair accessible version. Uh, the Coolum 16 wheelie boat and that means that disabled anglers like me can get on the water and fish in a boat that looks like and performs like all the other boats in a fishing fleet rather than having to rely on another accessible boat that may look different and may perform differently. Andy has already had a mess about in this particular boat and is happy with the results. It's, it's a super boat, it, it, it drifts well, it's nice and stable, it's easy to get in and out of um, We've got a, a great electric outboard on here, a Torquedo 2, two kilowatt outboard, which pushes it along extremely well. And you've got a whole day's charge in, in one battery. Um, this is the dozen, this is the twelfth boat of this particular model that we've supplied. And uh, we, we find them very popular. Disabled anglers are very uh, pleased that we've, we've come up with this innovation, uh, this, this new design. And uh, it, it ticks all the boxes. Right now the important bit, the fishing. What's the biggest fish Bernard has caught here? 
I think it was 5-7, a brown trout, somewhere out, you see that? No, you missed it, there was a wave out there, but it was just behind that. And uh, yes, I think it was a 5-7 brownie, and uh, I think that's when they gave me this sweater, which is quite nice, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it was a lovely fish, and we had it for about three meals, I think. It's a beauty. Not bad, but with an algal bloom in the water today, there isn't much hope of catching a fish like that today. Yeah. If you want to know more about the Wheelie Boat Trust, visit www.wheelieboats.org. Now it's off to David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. Cormorants may soon be back on the quarry list. After lobbying by the Countryside Alliance, Fisheries Minister Richard Benyon has set out the timetable to review the current licensing regime. He's due to report back to DEFRA in early 2012. The Angling Trust runs cormorantwatch.org, where you can record sightings of these birds. It's going to be another good year for grouse in the north of England, but in the highlands, the numbers are said to be patchy. That's the conclusion of research by shooting website gunsonpegs.com. It found one shoot in Inverness Shire has had to cancel 37 days this season. Online travel agents Cheap Flight has revealed the world's top 10 destinations for sport anglers. In third place is the Florida Keys where people go to catch shark and barracuda. In second place is Phuket in Thailand, a destination for tuna, swordfish and marlin. But the winner is Sutherland in northwest Scotland with its trout and salmon. Field Sports Channel's Mark Gilchrist is apparently now big down under. Struth, good day and no worries to all our viewers there. Mark has been interviewed about his life and passion for shooting on Australian internet radio. If you'd like to hear the interview, go to www.talkshoe.com and search for the Australian Hunting Podcast. The Metro newspaper, part of the Daily Mail group, is reporting gloomy news about the number of migratory birds. It highlights the plight of the yellow wagtail, nightingale and the grey partridge. So if you see a flock of partridges crossing the English Channel, remember, duck, and you read it first in the Metro. We finish with an appeal on behalf of Field Sports Channel. Now I do warn viewers that some of the images in this film are deeply disturbing. It's a pathetic sight, a once great hunter now on the scrap heap. A recluse, he sits around the house finding comfort in soft centres and trashy novels instead of embracing the great outdoors. Other colleagues are suffering the same fate. Sporting shooter editor Dom Holtam is pictured here wandering aimlessly, apparently without purpose, desperately in need of a second chance. But help is at hand and 10p is all it's going to take to make the difference. By sponsoring one of their films or any in the Field Sports Britain archive, you will breathe life into their empty shells, dragging them from the darkness, delivering them into the spotlight. Terms and conditions apply. We're not a registered charity, have no interest in helping others, just ourselves. We reckon it'd be good for your business because we get loads of hits. You're now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. A worthy cause there. Now let's go to Sweden where the Scandinavian version of Delia Smith, Helena Naral, shows us how to cook a fillet of elk. Soon we'll be bringing you a look behind the scenes of the Norma ammunition factory in Sweden. During our filming we stayed in Amatforge, halfway between Oslo and Stockholm in a special guest house called the White Moose. Looking after us was Helena Naral, who's just published a book of traditional Scandinavian tappers, a light, modern version of the original Scandinavian smorgasbord. Here she shows us the way she likes to cook an elk fillet. That's a lovely piece of meat. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what is it? It's a fillet of elk. Fillet of elk? Yes. This is a moose steak. It is. Fantastic. It's, it's We're in Sweden a... with moose steak. Well, yeah, you, you get it everywhere pretty much, but here in Värmland you get a lot. So this is a, a local uh, moose, probably seen it out here somewhere. <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to do a main course uh, from a recipe that I have from uh, my cookbook, in, uh, a tapas course, which is smaller. I'm going to make a main course with the filo of elk, which I've spiced with cinnamon. Um, and then I, uh, I fry it, have it in the oven. I serve it with a blueberry butter sauce, which is a very nice sauce, also uh, easy to make, and it uh, only takes maybe 10 or 15 minutes. It sounds delicious. Yeah. I don't want to stop you. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do is just to, to fix this fillet. Is there anything you can do with those trimmings? 
can you can you make anything with those trimmers? You've got a very hungry oh, yes, dog I, out there uh, called Keegan who indeed. would obviously like them. But this I will uh, put in pieces and I, f I, I, I probably fry it for him. Listen to me. <laughs> you fry it for Keegan? No, sometimes I do. Sometimes. Um, can you just tell us? Why not, not to make it too too hard to digest. Sir. So. Can you just tell us why he's called Keegan? Uh, I can indeed. He's um, when I when I first met him, he was like this. And, uh, and he looked absolutely like Kevin Keegan, one of my favorite footballs, of course, like most women's uh, favorite uh, football players ever. And also my husband's, he's a Liverpool fan, so, I, I, so he's a Keegan, but you can tell us, you, you met him. <laughs> we, we won't question your taste there, but uh, yes, he does look exactly like Kevin Keegan yeah. in, in his video. Yeah, there you go. So, those sides, okay, so there you go. Can we, can we just, can just smell it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it does, it does actually smell sweet now, but you're yeah, saying it's not yeah, going to be sweet yeah. when, it, when it comes to it. Huh? Right? Okay. It's a lot of meat, so, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it will just give it, you know, the, the, the touch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to make the blueberry sauce. Now, let me just eat six tablespoons. It's great mm -hmm. seeing you look at your own recipe in your own recipe book to see how to cook well, something. Well, of course, I'm a little bit nervous now since you're here, huh? <laughs> there you go. And then we need some red wine, and actually you can use any red wine. Well, even, you, even rubbish, even terrible, even really good? Um, well, usually it's, it's not been that old uh, here, but uh, not, not vinegar wine, of course not, but uh, you can use, you know, last week's wine, it's okay. You need uh, 300 milliliters of sugar. But you were saying this is not going to be sweet, but it is going to be quite sweet. Well, yeah, yeah, uh, sauce, well, you will taste it, it's sweet, but it's not as too sweet. 150 milliliters. So what do you okay. think, the, the sugar and the, and the berries, will they kind of fight each other or make friends with each other or what will happen when you put the two together? Uh, there is a process of course uh, with the sourness, the sweetness and the saltness which uh, um, and the berries that will, you know, it's a chemical thing I suppose. It will mix and the, the, um, will make it perfect. Uh, Perfectly nice sauce, okay? So I'll put these uh, berries in here. There you go. Look at those. There you go. Gosh, they're rich, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, so this this is going here. It's a darker red yeah. than the blood on the steak, isn't it? It That's is. Really is and also when you put it, yeah, when you put, put it uh, with some red meat, um, the blue sauce. Uh, today we're gonna have uh, red uh, uh, tomatoes and some green uh, asparagus. To go with that, you can also mix with colors, but the blue sauce goes very nice to it. The, the place you run here is called the White Moose. It is. Are, are there White Moose around here? It is. That's actually, um, it's not albinos like uh, a lot of people think. It's um, a genetic um, white moose, white elf. And, and it's here, around 40 of them. And, and uh, what are they, like a, a family of them? Yes, a family. Only living in this part of uh, Sweden. Once in a while, one of them goes over to Norway, which is uh, quite close, and they get totally crazy in media. They say this uh, albino elk, which doesn't belong to the you know fauna, uh, uh, ran into Norway. They make a big you know big fuss. Okay, what I'm gonna do now? I'm just gonna fry this. You see, it's you know it's getting brown and it's getting foamy, and you want it to be a little bit foamy and go down before you put it in. Okay, so I'm gonna put it in now, yeah. So. Oh, again, the smell is fantastic. Yeah. You're really letting it swim in the butter, aren't you? I am. Is that because is that it's absorbing butter? What's, what's it doing? Mm. Mm, I just, it just gives the flavor to, to the, and make sure that, you know, the crust is, uh, otherwise it would stick in the pan. I could probably have used a little bit less uh, butter, but... Yeah. Well, butter's fast, and, yeah. and one of the things so, to take doesn't have to So let it rest here for a little bit. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, you know, put this into this... Um, this thing here, what do you call it? It's a sieve. Sieve. Or colander, okay. isn't it? So... so it's, you, it's like so a jam. You get, yeah, you get the berries out. Like that. Now I'm go just gonna leave it here. This you can you, this uh, for 
main course you can uh, it's for eight people about eight to ten people it's quite strong in the taste so you don't need that much oh look at this huh wow perfect huh? gorgeous now you can also see that it's staying inside okay this is really nice just a few and then another few but you're taking it without off. without making the sauce grow cold because that, that's the thing you need the sauce to stay warm because you can't boil it after and you need to do a little bit of you know like this but you, you've taken it off the heat though haven't you yeah i have but it's still warm since the uh, butter is also warm also room temperature the, the sauce will not get cold if you have cold butter in here then the sauce will go cold and you can't boil it so this way it stays uh, warm and good there you go wow it is it's really it is absolutely bloodier than the steak <laughs> in a way yes. you sort of expect huh? the steak to be bloody and now the sauce is bloodier <laughs> Blue is not red, okay. <laughs> okay, I, I beat you out here. <laughs> you certainly did, Charlie. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, this is uh, filet of elk, which is uh, cinnamon spiced. Uh, it's a uh, medium rare. It's uh, oven baked potatoes, cocktail tomatoes, some asparagus and a blueberry butter sauce. So bon appetit, hope you like it. I can't wait, thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> right, uh, this is Absolutely like butter. Gamey butter, butter. Bit of the red stuff. It's traditional for me to go, wow. But this really is a wow. If you would like to buy Helena's Scandinavian Tapas cookbook or stay at the White Moose, please get in touch with her at Helena at vita-algen.com. Helena's White Moose Hotel is justly famous. Staying on White Deer, there have been a surprising number on Dartmoor this year. White Red Deer are not unusual. They're not as common as White Fallow, but there are a lot more of them than White Roebuck. Last year, we brought you the once in a decade event that was the White Roebuck of Scotland. When we said that stalkers would pay good money to go and shoot a White Deer, the newspapers wrote complaining articles. There is no doubt that white deer have a value. Well, we, we have quite a, an exceptional group of uh, clients who would uh, line up quite quickly for, for such a thing. Again, with a, uh, even with a, a black coloured roebuck or even a peruke head, as, as you've seen recently, perukes fetch a high price. We're talking about £12,000 for the uh, world record peruke last Correct, week. yes. Now you may be wondering why I'm wearing a tie. Have I been asked grouse shooting? Sadly not. It's the idea of Pete Allen, one of our viewers. He says, why don't I wear a shoot or fishing club tie every week, say a little bit about the shoot or the fishing club, and at the end of the year, perhaps we can gather up all the ties and send them off to some worthy shooting charity auction so that somebody can wake up the following morning with a hangover, wondering where he's got all those ties from. This is the Cahays Castle shoot tie from my own collection. And it's a beautiful West Country pheasant shoot with some fabulous Norfolk style partridges. I loved it. Uh, if you would like to send me your tie to where it uh, goes to the address that's appearing on the bottom of the screen now. Now, Roy Lupton has got a problem not with white deer, but with brown spotty ones. A fellow buck, does he take a headshot or not? Sometimes you go out with the intention of hunting one species and you end up with something completely different. This evening, Roy Lupton is once again attracting the females. The rodos come and play with the buttolo, but unfortunately there are no bucks in residence, or if there are, not the flavour he wants. However, the beginning of August is the start of the fallow buck season. If you want one to put in the freezer, now is a good time to take it, as the meat can get tainted the closer we get to the fallow rut in the autumn. And what happened? The rodos that we just called in came in behind him and they pushed him into a little row of scrubby trees here. So we're just gonna go down, he'll probably move out of here and try and go through um, by the side of the lake down here. So, I mean, he might just clear off straight through or he might just stop and give us a shot. So, we'll give it a, drink, we'll give it a go and see what happens. Roy now has his sights on him while the roebuck rut continues elsewhere. Roy gets into a position to take a shot, but the only option he has is a headshot. 
We've dealt with headshots before and they certainly aren't recommended for those who are not experienced enough. As with all shooting, you have to make a judgement about your own ability. Roy has spent years stalking and dispatching cull animals. This buck is a great specimen and has plenty of fat on him. So how does Roy justify the headshot? The reason that I had to uh, head shoot this particular animal tonight was he'd run round and gone in the path and that path runs round the side of the lake. Now if I'd taken a body shot on him there was a good chance that he would have he could have shot off and um, run into the lake um, because where he was either either side that he went then he would have been in the water and that was the only shot that I had. The, the shot that we had earlier when he was up on the hill we didn't have a safe backstop so we had to manoeuvre ourselves into a position and hope that as he pushed out of the bushes there that he'd come down and stop which he did um, and it, 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 you can actually see so he, he stops and then looks back at us um, even though as I say I had a broadside possible shot then uh, I decided to take the headshot because it would have dropped him on the spot and I, I didn't fish, fancy having to, to try and pull him out of the, uh, the lake afterwards so that was the only option available to me on that one. A good end to the evening and Roy fills the larder with his favourite venison. Well, we're back next week when, with any luck, we'll be teaching a rioting, looting scumbag how to shoot in order to instil a little citizenship and responsibility in him. This has been Field Sports Britain, and if you're watching this on YouTube, please, please, please hit the subscribe button that's somewhere up there, or might be down there, or over there. Or you could go to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, scroll down and you'll find our constant contact box. You can pop your email address in there, you can click to like us, on Facebook in the same place or follow us on Twitter and every week we'll send you news of our glorious programme, Field Sports Britain.